All right, well, I'm Kurt Daniel. I've seen a lot of you, maybe not all of you, most of you, a lot of you from time to time. I'm uh, the director of the cardiac cath lab up at High Point Hospital. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I'm one of those guys who put stents in people. It's a fun job. It's a good time. And I see you guys from time to time when you bring folks to us uh, frequently for STEMIs, uh, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Mark asked me to talk about, uh, about EKG interpretation of uh, STEMIs and also things that look like a STEMI but ain't. And that's a real difficult challenge sometimes. Just to review things, everybody here I think knows what an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction is. It's a bad kind of heart attack that tends to kill people. As a matter of fact, about 50% of people who have that kind of a heart attack probably die before they see you. They never get, the, they never get to the phone many of the time, much of the time. Um, and I know you all have had experiences where they do get to the phone, they get to you, but they don't make it to the emergency room. Um, or they get to you, they get to the phone, they get to you, they get to the emergency room, and they die in the emergency room before they make it to me. That happened last night with us. So time is very, 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 very important. One of you, were you, were you, do one of you on, you know the call I'm talking about? The roach spray guy? Yeah. So, sad, sad, thank you. Sad, uh, sad situation, sad stories, but that's, that's the truth, that's the reality of ST segment myocardial infarction, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction is time is critical, every second counts. Uh, I've seen people who I think they're, they're going to make it no problem, and they just die right in front of you, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. So whenever I see this kind of heart attack, I move as quickly as I can. Now, and this is something that all cardiologists are doing, and this is a revolution in cardiology care that started oh, 15 or 20 years ago in reality, but, you know, in a more dedicated way, about 12 years ago, with regionalized STEMI networks and 24-7 cath labs and call teams and uh, more, even more recently than that, allowing you guys to activate the cath lab, to, you know, make us come in, um, uh, even at 2 in the morning, even if we don't really feel like it. If you say, I'm coming into the hospital, I'm coming into the hospital. Uh, there's no two ways about it. And all of us, uh, all of the doctors who do this for a living think that that's the right thing to do, that you guys should have the power and the ability to do that. If you are right about it, that's wonderful. If you are wrong about it, that's still wonderful. We're happy about it. We're coming in. If somebody comes in, if we come in to see a patient and it turns out it's not actually a bad heart attack, that's great, good. The patient is going to do well. We're perfectly happy. But I'm going to talk about ways that you can be more certain it's a heart attack or less certain it's a heart attack. Now, in uh, response to all of this, uh, this uh, good behavior, hopefully on everybody's part, we have decreased what we call the door to balloon time. That's from the uh, duration of time between when the patient comes into the door of the hospital until I use a balloon to open up the artery. And in the past, 20 years ago, it was a couple of hours before a person got their artery opened in this kind of a heart attack. More recently, it's gotten lower and lower. Our average has been, it's 43 <coughs> minutes now, but it's it's been around 40 minutes on average. They're, you know, the, lo the shortest time I remember was 11 minutes when they get to the door till, till we get the artery open. The quicker the better, in my opinion. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Um, as a consequence <coughs> of this decrease in, in time, the mortality rate from this kind of heart attack has dropped a lot. So um, because of this, there's a bias among cardiologists against missing a heart attack. And you guys, too, you certainly wouldn't want to miss a heart attack. In this setting, it's possible that you can have false STEMI activations. You know, you see somebody and you think, gosh, maybe this is a STEMI. So I'm going to talk about ways to differentiate one from the other. <clears throat> now, there's been some research about how commonly false STEMI activations uh, occur. Uh, there's some variety. Um, for the most part, I think it's probably around 20% of cases. Um, some reports of higher series are not, not from really places where I think that the data are really very good. In places like um, um, Hennepin County in Minnesota and Boston, you know, on the 20 to 30 percent kind of range. And I think that's just fine. If we have a 20 to 30 percent false semi activation rate, that's fine. You guys have actually been lower than that, more like 15 percent, 20 percent. That's where, not, I don't know about you guys, your county in particular, but our hospital, High Point Regional, the false STEMI activation rate has been 15 to 20 percent for a long time. The lowest 10 percent during some quarters, so not bad at all. So the cases that are difficult, where it's difficult to make uh, the correct call, are post-arrest cases. After a cardiac arrest, everybody's EKG looks weird. Hard to know what the hell to make of it a lot of the time. 
particularly early on, particularly when you're in an ambulance and worried about, God, we need to move quick for this guy who just died and we made him undead. Cardiogenic shock patients, they're really tachycardic. There's a lot of weird stuff going on with the acids and bases in the body. Makes it difficult to interpret the EKG. Aortic dissections that dissect down into the coronary ostea, that looks just like a STEMI, but it's not a coronary issue. It's, a, it's an aorta disaster. Pulmonary embolism with right heart strain can look like an anterior MI. It's very difficult to differentiate. People who have stress cardiomyopathy, the Takotsubo syndrome, the, heart, the, the uh, uh, broken heart syndrome, you all heard of that? So those will look exactly like a STEMI because the physiology is pretty similar. When you take these people to the cath lab, their anterior wall and their apex isn't working. And, but the flow in their, uh, their arteries, is the, the arteries that we can see, is fine. What's probably happening is that the capillaries are constricting from local re release of adrenaline that causes poor blood flow at the capillary level that we can't see. So it's a blood flow problem. It's just not the usual big old blood clot in the coronary artery. There can be transient ST elevation from coronary vasospasm. I don't know if you all have seen that, a Prinz metal angina case. That can happen. And then atrial flutter. Atrial flutter gives you what looks like inferior ST elevation. So it can be really tricky if you're looking at an atrial flutter EKG. You all remember John Ritter, Three's Company? So he came into the hospital with what looked like an inferior wall STEMI. We took him to the cath lab, and his coronaries were fine, but his aortic root had dissected down into his right coronary artery, and he died before they could do anything about it. Lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. It's not like the doctors could have known any better. I mean, hell. But that's an example of a difficult case that looked like a STEMI but really wasn't. And that's not a false activation. I mean, heck. This is how that happens, just out of curious, in case you're curious. So when the aorta tears, it's on the outer wall of the aorta. Rarely does, it rarely tears on the inner wall of the aorta. And the right coronary artery comes off right here and goes around the right side of the heart. And so as it tears back this direction, it can tear down and tear into the right coronary artery and effectively pinch it off. Anyhow, aortic dissections. So there are false STEMIs, which aren't really a STEMI, but look for all the world like a STEMI. And then there are misleading EKGs. So here are some of the misleading EKGs I'm sure you guys have come across and will come across again. Cases of left ventricular uh, repolarization or left ventricular hypertrophy with a repolarization abnormality. Early repolarization, which is a normal variant in lots of people. We'll look at some of these. Pericarditis and myocarditis. Those look a lot like a STEMI, but the pattern doesn't quite fit. We'll talk about that. Poor quality EKGs and someone who's swinging at you or whatever, doing CPR, those can be impossible to interpret. This is a difficult one. People who have had a prior MI who have an LV aneurysm. I was looking at one of those EKGs this morning. Hyperkalemia. And you guys never have an old EKG to look at. I frequently have an old EKG to look at, and that helps me um, in lots and lots of cases. Now, you all, I assume you all read EKGs and you've done this before. All of you, what, so how many are EMT basics here? No EMTB, a couple EMTBs. How many are intermediates? Some states don't have hardly any intermediates. And, and how many are, the rest are paramedics, is that right? All right. So let me give you just a little quick rundown. I'm sure most of you know all of this about EKGs. When you do an EKG on a patient, each heartbeat has a particular pattern that goes along with it. There is a P wave, which is caused by the atria depolarizing before they contract. There's a flat segment called the PR interval. There may or may not be a little Q wave, depending on what lead you look at, then an R and an S. This is called the QRS complex, this segment here. The part we look at mostly for heart attacks is the segment between the end of the QRS complex and this T wave over here. This is the ST segment, all right? If there is elevation there, if this is the ST segment is above the baseline, the electrical baseline of the heart, that's ST elevation. That's what we're talking about. When you see that, that means that the heart is being uh, injured right then and there. Here's why it looks like that. On this side, this is an illustration of ST segment depression. This is an illustration of ST segment elevation. I don't have a normal there for comparison, but the ST segment should be along the same flat line as the PR segment. If there is ischemia on the inner wall of the heart, as happens when there's, oh, maybe a 90% blockage or a 75% blockage or an 80% blockage in someone who's having a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. 
That means that the artery that runs across the surface of the heart has enough flow to it to get through, to get to the capillaries that feed the outer parts of the muscle, but not the inner parts of the muscle. So the downstream end of the capillaries isn't getting enough blood flow. So you have ischemia on the cavity side of the muscle. When that happens, the electricity that you're reading on the outside of the chest, this is supposed to be lead V5 sitting out over here someplace, right? So the electricity that's perceived by lead V5 is dominated by the electricity going this way. There's not the same balance. So when you're looking at these electricity currents on the surface of the chest, you're looking at the balance between electricity going in and out. That's what leads to the P waves and the QRS complexes and the STs and the T waves. If there is an imbalance in the electricity, you see something going up or down above the baseline. In the ST segment, it's normally balanced with inward and outward currents. If the inside wall of the uh, myocardium is ischemic, then it's dominated by inward current going away from lead V5, and you see ST segment depression. If there is a transmural, meaning the whole wall is dying, the whole wall is being equally killed because there is 100% occlusion of the artery, as happens with STEMI. You see ST segment elevation because there is no electricity in this part of the heart. The electricity from the opposite wall is coming toward you. That's why you see ST segment elevation and why you see reciprocal ST depression. You all heard the term reciprocal ST depression. We're going to look at that. That's very important. You all, you all got that injury current stuff there? No. Now, when a coronary artery is interrupted with uh, a STEMI, not so much with a non-STEMI, with a STEMI, an interrupted coronary artery causes ST elevation in a pattern that corresponds to the coronary artery anatomy. If the left anterior descending artery is blocked, that's the one that goes down the front of the heart, you get an anterior wall MI. If it's the right coronary artery that wraps around the heart this way and goes to the bottom wall of the heart, that's an inferior MI. If it's the circumflex, that causes lateral wall MIs. So here is a cartoon, obviously, of the heart showing where those arteries sit. The anterior artery, the right coronary artery, and the left circumflex artery. Now, uh, here, here's you know, how your EKG leads go on the patient. So you have this triangle, this uh, inverted triangle that shows you where each lead goes, lead 2, lead 3, lead AVF. They point toward the inferior wall of the heart. So inferior wall MIs you see in lead 2, lead 3, and lead AVF over here. And these are the anterior leads where you see anterior infarcts. Lateral infarcts you see over here in lead 1 and lead AVL, which point toward the left lateral side of the heart. Now, I remember this, or I teach this anymore, right? I, when I was learning this, I was taught to remember this because the part of the heart is corresponds to the part of the EKG that you look at, at least for anterior and inferior. So here is an example of an inferior wall infarct where there's ST elevation in lead 2, lead 3, and lead AVF. It's not so much reciprocal depression. This is a subtle one. But if I take that off for just a second, imagine that this is a person here, and this is their heart, and this is the front of their chest, and we put the EKG back up there for a second. This is the inferior wall of the EKG. If we took that piece of paper and just put it across the patient's chest, the two, the three, and the AVF would be here, along the right coronary artery, right where that right coronary artery sits, okay, the inferior wall of the heart. So this is how you recognize the inferior wall of MI. You guys see that okay? I'm sorry if my big fat box in there. Similarly, for an anterior MI, this is a great big, huge anterior wall of MI. Everybody can see that as the elevation. looks like tombstones over here, reciprocal depression over here. The ST elevation in that part of the EKG goes right along where the LAD is located, right there, on the front of this patient's chest. Okay, if you put that EKG on my chest, it would be going, the ST elevation would be here, would be going right where the left anterior descending artery is, right? So that's an anterior infarct. Lateral wall EK, uh, STEMIs are a little bit more tricky because it's pointing over toward the left shoulder there. So it would be lead one and lead AVL. But at least for the anteriors and the inferiors, it's a quick mnemonic to remember which one you're looking at. You got me? All right. Here's a quick case. 55-year-old guy getting ready for work, probably a Monday morning. Developed nausea, sweating, progressive crushing chest pain. You guys have all seen this guy, right? I see this guy a lot. His wife made him come into the, made him call 911 because he would. You know that guy. He's sweaty. He's diaphoretic. He, he's uh, kind of pale. He's kind of gray. 
So what do you guys see? I, I assume you guys all see the ST elevation down here. This is a pretty typical inferior wall STEMI. So we have inferior wall ST elevation down here, showing a transmural infarct of that inferior wall of the heart. And we have reciprocal depression on the anterior wall that shows that the electricity is moving towards the inferior wall because there's no balance anymore. The, the reciprocal depression is very important. That tells me that this is not a mimic. This is not an old infarct that's mimicking, mimicking a new infarct. The reciprocal <coughs> depression is really key in my mind. I took this guy to the cath lab. Here's what we see. You guys see that OK? It's too bright. You guys see that all right? This is the right coronary artery going around. And it doesn't have many branches over here. This is where the right ventricle is. There's two RV branches. And then it comes down here and it feeds the inferior wall of the left ventricle with these branches down here. These are really where the money is. And you can see somebody put a white jelly bean right in the artery there. What that is is a clot. There's a cholesterol plaque there. The cholesterol started to come through that skin that covers over the inside of the blood vessel and touches the blood. When cholesterol touches blood, blood reacts just like it, if it touches skin or touches anything else. It clots because the blood thinks that the artery must be breaking open. And a clot forms there, and the clot can occlude the artery. This artery wasn't quite occluded, about 99%. There's enough blood flowing around it where you can see where the artery is. We put a little balloon in there. We put a little stent in there. You can see we've got a coronary wire down here. We've got a balloon blowing up in there. Put a stent in there, and this is what it looks like afterwards. Blood flow is restored. The guy lives. Moves on. That's what we want to have happen. That makes sense? So anterior wall MIs. When you're reading these EKGs, um, you can tell a little bit whether the blockage is down here, over here, or way up here by how extensive the ST elevation is. If it's just, if the blockage is just down here, you'll only see ST elevation in V1, V2, and V3. The more proximal it is, the more you see it in V3, 4, 5, and 6, and way over here, and V1 and AVL. So, that's, uh, that tells you how many of those diagonal branches are involved. Or in certain cases, if the left main is involved. And we've had a couple of really bad left main stemmies lately. So here is an example of a typical anterior wall STEMI with ST elevations uh, over here to lead V5. So this, <coughs> this doesn't go all the way to lead V6, but it does involve AVL and lead 1, so the lateral. So this is a pretty big anterolateral STEMI. So it's got a lot of the diagonals, maybe the left main, it's hard to know for sure. There is reciprocal depression. And you might wonder, is this a new STEMI or an old STEMI? Because you look down here in lead V3, there's a Q wave there. Sometimes that can suggest that this is an old infarct with an aneurysm. But we know it's not because there's reciprocal depression here. It's possible this guy had an old MI and was revascularized, and now his stent is occluded or his bypass graft is occluded. But, you know, um, when I, you see that Q wave, some folks, some of you smart folks who've done this for a while will think, well, gosh, maybe it's an elving aneurysm. The reason you know it's not is because of the reciprocal depression. All right? All right. Here are some things to know about the appearance of the ST segment. The way the ST segment looks is useful in helping you to distinguish normal variants or unhealthy variants from STEMIs. Um, Normally, the ST segment is concave, meaning it's smiling at you. See how that's smiling at you? Smiling at you. So these are all ST segment elevation due to early repolarization. These are all examples of that. Early repolarization is just a change in how the heart muscle repolarizes after it contracts. Um, and that's something that you see in young, healthy people. You do EKGs in 18-year-old kids, you're going to see this all day long. You do it in healthy athletes, you're going to see this all day long, early repolarization. Uh, this is a uh, much more complicated and busy slide showing different things. LV, left ventricular hypertrophy, left bundle branch blocks, which is a common confusing one because you have really high ST elevation. It looks kind of scary. Pericarditis, a pseudo-infarct pattern from hyperkalemia. Uh, this is an interest. And the, here's some, some infarcts, interceptal infarct, an interceptal infarct with a bundle branch block and Brugada syndrome, which I don't want to get into Brugada syndrome. That's a, that's a pain in the neck. But at any rate, you can tell by looking at the pattern of the ST segments here a little bit. These ones are upward concave. They're smiling at you. Okay? These ones over here 
That one looks like a tombstone. This one is a little elevated and it's kind of subtle, but it's definitely not smiling at you. It's frowning at you. You know what I mean when I'm saying smiling at you versus frowning at you? If it's frowning at you, that's a bad thing. That makes sense, doesn't it? Here's a routine EKG in a 30-year-old athlete. I don't do routine anything. I only do things if we need to. But, uh, anyhow, here's a routine EKG in a 30-year-old athlete. Looks a little bit funny. There's some T-wave inversion here. ST segment's probably okay there. ST segments over here are really tall. They're far above the baseline. Kind of funny looking, kind of pointy looking T-wave. So this is early repolarization. You'll notice there is no reciprocal ST depression. No reciprocal depression. Oops, up here. That's an important differentiating factor, as I mentioned a couple of times. How about this one? Here's a 60-year-old person who came to the hospital with shortness of breath. What are we seeing here? Well, I've got ST elevation here. Who thinks it is smiling at you? Who's, who thinks it's smiling? Look at this lead right here. Who thinks it's frowning? Who thinks it's smiling? Who's not sure? <coughs> Who's not sure? If you're not sure, you're an honest man. <laughs> Let me draw it over here a little bit. Here's the QRS complex. So if I put two little dots there, that kind of looks like smiling. You see that up here? Let's try this down here. QRS complex here. I put two, I put two dots there. That's a frowny face. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. When I look at this EKG here, I'm looking at this ST segment. Here's the QRS complex. Comes down that way. This is where the ST segment starts. Okay. This is a little bit subtle. So there's a little bit of a slur there. There's a little bit of an up slur there. So it's over here, it's almost a straight line, isn't it? But here, it's a, just a little bit slurred. And this is how the ST segment is supposed to look normally. Now, you see some depression over here, so you might be worried. Oh, gosh. And maybe this is a stent. However, when you see reciprocal ST depression, that involves the anterior leads and the inferior leads only, or predominant. So if there is an anterior infarct, you'll see reciprocal depression in the inferior leads. Not elsewhere, the inferior leads. I don't see any ST depression down here, right? So there is not reciprocal depression. So this is a case that's not a STEMI. You notice the QRS complex is wide, right? This is a left bundle branch block, EKG, which looks a bit like a STEMI, yeah. But it's not a STEMI. This is left ventricular hypertrophy in a person who's not having a heart attack. Tricky EKG, right? Not easy. What about this guy? 53-year-old guy, nauseous, sweaty, looks kind of crappy. He looks like maybe he's having an inferior MI, one of those kind of... How about this guy? Well, I see ST elevation here, here, here. And I see some ST depression there. I see the ST segments are flat, maybe a little bit down sloping here. So this is a tricky EKG. Now, who thinks... This ST segment is uh, this ST segment is smiling. Who thinks this EK ST segment is frowning? I think it's probably smiling because it's curving up that way. You got me there. Now it's clearly not the normal EKG, but is it a STEMI? Is there reciprocal ST depression in lead two, three, or AVF? Probably not. These down sloping ST depressions are usually manifestations of left ventricular hypertrophy. When you see ST depression that is horizontal, that's much more consistent with a reciprocal depression. Subtle, difficult things, but you guys know what you're doing. That's why I'm telling you. And over here, you see this funny T wave inversion pattern. This is an asymmetrical T wave inversion. One side is different from the other. Symmetrical. <coughs> T-wave inversions are seen with ischemia. Asymmetrical T-wave inversions are seen with hypertrophy and a bunch of other things. All right? So what did this turn out to be? Left ventricular hypertrophy again. Lots and lots of electricity here. The QRS complexes overlap one another. That's a pretty specific finding for left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is another person who's not having a heart attack. Tricky, difficult. 
27 year old kid, severe chest pain, had similar symptoms a year ago but didn't go to see a doctor. What do you think of this EKG? These are real life EKGs, you can tell because you know you can't, it's not perfect, you can't see where the boxes are. I'm giving you real deals here. This is lead one, lead two, lead three, uh, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I see ST elevation here, here, maybe a little bit here, here. Hard to see much there, there, here, here, here. Do you think that these ST segments are smiling or frowning? Who thinks they're smiling? Who thinks they're frowning? Very, very tricky. I think these ST segments are probably smiling. I think all of them are smiling. Do you see any reciprocal depression? Anybody see convincing reciprocal depression? I don't see recip convincing reciprocal depression. So this is either a heart attack that is involving the inferior wall and the lateral wall, interlateral wall, which I guess is possible if you have weird coronary anatomy, or something else. It, it, it could happen. This is not an easy EKG. Um, but this is a case of pericarditis. There's one other subtle clue here which I wouldn't expect you to know. Um, one thing that you see with pericarditis is you see depression of the PR segment, okay? Uh, the PR segment, the, the little segment between the P wave and the QRS complex is supposed to be flat. It's not supposed to be down sloping. These PR segments are all down sloping. So there is a problem with repolarization, not just in the ventricles, but in the atria too. They're all inflamed. So this kid has myopericarditis. He had it a year ago. You can have recurrent pericarditis, recurrent mild pericarditis. Again, these are, these are hard, and I'm showing them to you on purpose. So, patient complains of two hours of severe chest heaviness and nausea. Let's look at this one. You guys see this one okay? Is it coming through? Sorry if it's not the best photocopy. So, I see, who, who sees uh, some ST elevation? Everybody see some ST elevation? So, there's ST elevation here, here. Here, 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 here. Who thinks this is smiling? Who thinks this is frowning? Who's not sure? Still not sure. Right. It's fine. Look at this one right uh, here and here. Lead V2. So, and, and lead V1 also. If it is smiling and I put a straight edge there, <coughs> then it'll go underneath the edge. If it is frowning at you, then it'll go over the edge. This is just barely over the edge of the paper. Does that make any sense to you? So these are frowny ST segments that look like tombstones. Huh. Ah. So there's just a little bit of the curve that way. You know, another way to think about it is this one looks like somebody took their thumb and pushed it up there like that. The other ones that I showed you looks like someone took their thumb from above and pushed it down like that. The reason I don't like that analogy is because nobody gives a thumbs up for a step. <laughs> I'm just saying. So we have funny looking ST segments that are kind of frowny here. These V1, V2, V3, V4, <laughs> not so much V5 or V6. These V1 and AVL look okay. Is there a reciprocal depression? Maybe a little bit here in lead two. That's kind of upsloping. Tough to say, maybe a little bit of a funny appearance there in the AVF. These are hard EKGs. The patient complains of two hours of severe chest heaviness and nausea. I'm honest, I don't, I don't remember what EKGs I put in here, so I don't know if this is a STEMI or not. And personally, if I'm looking at this EKG, I think this is probably a STEMI, but I'm not sure. Who thinks it's a STEMI? I'm, I'm speaking honestly, I don't know if it's a STEMI or not. Who, yeah. Who, think, who thinks it's Who thinks it's definitely not? Anybody? I, I think that I would call this a STEMI if I was you guys. And I would definitely take this guy to the cath lab, particularly given the history. Two hours of chest heaviness and nausea. I, I think if you guys call this, I'm taking this guy to the cath lab all day long. But I'm not positive. And you know, the number of cases that I take to the cath lab thinking it's a STEMI and it turns out not to be a STEMI, that does happen. And I don't mind. That's okay. But I think this is an acute anterior MI. Now, 70-year-old male, severe chest pain, almost resolved, except for sharp-ish pain during inspiration. Who wrote that? Did I write that? Good Lord in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> sharp. 
Is that, a, is that a, like a, a sitcom on CBS or something? Sharpie? Yeah. Anyhow, so what do we got going on here? All right, so this lead looks okay. This lead probably is all right. This lead, there's a Q wave there. This lead, there's a Q wave there. So maybe an old inferior infarct. What's going on over here? B1. This is obviously where there's something funny going on, right? So did somebody take their thumb this way or thumb this way? Who thinks, who thinks it's, it's a thumbs up? Who thinks thumbs down? <laughs> the most people think thumbs up. Maybe that analogy is working better. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice the T waves look fine. Okay. Are those, do you think that those T waves are symmetrically inverted T waves? Like this one? Or are they asymmetric? I think they're probably symmetric. So these are a little pointier. Okay. But I think they're still symmetrical from side to side as opposed to being pointy but asymmetric. Does that make sense? So I think these are symmetrically inverted T waves that are inverted and pretty deep. And I think the ST segment looks abnormal. The only kicker is he's got these Q waves here. Okay? The waves that have the ST elevation also have very deep Q waves. Q waves in leads, except for this one and this one, means an old injury. And the Q wave needs to be wider than a tiny one little box. You know, they're big boxes and little boxes. If the Q wave is wider than a little box, it's a significant Q wave. It means that there may have been an old injury. That's not a 100% thing. There's some things we're definite about with EKGs. A lot of things we're not definite about. Q waves are an indefinite <laughs> thing. They're not certain. But this guy has Q waves, which are deep and wide. There's nothing going up at all until you get over there. So is this a person who has an acute heart attack, or is this a person who has an old heart attack with an aneurysm there? Not and formed an aneurysm that soon. It would have to be at least three or four days ago. So, yeah. Maybe yesterday? Well, I don't know. Maybe. If he was hurt yesterday and it stopped, could it look like that like a day after? If you, had you know, typically it takes three or four days for that appearance to develop. But, you know, when you, as you guys know, I admit people to the hospital all the time with heart attacks. And I watch their EKGs day to day and how they change. And eventually, a bad heart attack that we are unsuccessful in getting open will look like this a few days later. Or someone who shows up a week later or four days later after their heart attack looks like this. So it may be that. Maybe that. What's this thing? Yeah. A completed or old anterior MI. So I think you got that one right. Do I still need to take this guy to the cath lab? It's tough to tell. Would you do like a routine cath lab? Like you just schedule it and you go and do it? The, so... I don't, do, I don't do routine things. I don't do it just for fun. I would only do it if I thought that I needed to, to fix something in there. If a heart attack is completed and you don't have any function of that part of the heart anymore, you're not going to help the person. However, after <coughs> heart attacks, um, frequently a lot of the heart is still alive. Some of the muscle is still alive. It's just what we call hibernating. And there are ways that we test what we do. We do what's called viability testing. We can do that with... MRI scans, CAT scans, no, not CAT, MRI scans, PET scans, or a special kind of echo to see if there is some tissue that is still alive in there that we could resurrect if we reopen the artery. But after about 12 hours after a STEMI, the benefit of an emergency heart catheterization is probably minimal. If a person is still having symptoms, and in particular if their symptoms have been coming and going, what we used to call, or we still call, a stuttering MI. I still may take that person to the cath lab at right then. But it sort of depends. So this is a difficult, a difficult clinical scenario. And this is someone who I would definitely suggest you ought to call as a STEMI. But that's what's going on with this case. Tricky. All right. Early diabetic, elderly diabetic female with dementia and shortness of breath. I sure love taking old, demented people to the cath lab. <laughs> Just like you love them having them in the back of your truck, I think. What do we got going on here? Let's see. Hmm. ST elevation over here, pretty diffusely, leads to three, sorry, V2, V3, V4, V5, maybe a little bit in V6, a little bit in 1, a little bit in AVL. Not sure what's going on over here. The ST segment looks a little elevated in that lead. Here it looks closer to normal. 
here in lead three it's a little bit depressed here in lead AVF it's probably okay so this is another tough one are there Q waves yeah there sure are Q waves there this is another difficult case is this a STEMI is it not a STEMI I'm not positive but I am concerned by these deep Q waves that this is probably an old um, an old uh, an old infarct with an aneurysm there probably this is another one of those cases where the first thing I'm thinking is give me her old EKG something that you guys generally don't have the benefit of what do you guys think of this one again if you call this one I'm happy yeah I think that's very reasonable so this is another completed MI with an LV aneurysm when you have an L, when you have a left ventricular aneurysm that's scarring of the heart when you cut these people open for surgery it looks like leather it looks like someone left part of their shoe on the front of this person's heart it's just stiff the electricity isn't working there anymore and you see the electricity on the other side of the heart coming through that's why you see the ST elevation there. if I take her to the cath lab I see there's a completed infarct I take the cath route we send her upstairs that's all there is to it you worry uh, about complications of heart catheterizations in people um, the older they are the frailer they are uh, things like that you're more likely to have complications in women than men probably because the arteries are smaller and so whenever I'm thinking about doing an emergency heart cath I'm not only thinking about the potential for benefit but I'm thinking about how likely it is am I going to hurt this person so anyhow it's a tough t a tough call but it's my call dialysis patient with chest pain kind of hadn't been to dialysis for a while I think <coughs> decided to skip a few weeks started to feel crummy gave you guys a call so what do we see in this one who wants, who wants to tell me what they see here tall pointy T waves I used to be more pointy than I am now but I'll take the tall tall pointy T waves it looks like if you sat on them it would hurt your butt is that right and somebody said hyperkalemia is that right yeah, that's a pretty typical hyperkalemia EKG. There's not really ST depression, or sorry, ST elevation. It's just you have really funny looking T waves, don't you? Yeah. Typical hyperkalemia one. What about this one? So this was this one here is mild hyperkalemia. Potassium's probably six, six and a half. This is moderate hyperkalemia, different person. As you can see these, they're almost as tall and as pointy as the QRS complex. You start to get in a little bit more trouble when your potassium gets to 9 or 10. You start to see something that looks like this. And so it's, it's not uncommon to think that this is ST elevation. This is actually still part of the QRS complex, believe it or not. This person's heart is beating in such a cattywampus, bizarre way that you see this bizarre, wide pattern. And... Uh, He's probably going to die hyperkalemia. <laughs> the highest potassium level that, that I've ever encountered was a patient of my wife's who's a kidney specialist whose potassium got to 13, and he lived. Some people are used to missing dialysis for a few weeks, and for some reason their body adapts to it, and they get through these things. Probably going to die hyperkalemia. So uh, this isn't ST elevation, but uh, this is something that sometimes people think is ST elevation. So what's going on here? What's this heart rhythm called? Torsades. Looks like a twisting rivet, doesn't it? Like if you took it, took your EKG rhythm strip and twisted it, uh, the uh, the QRSs would look like that. What happened here? Did he get a shock? No, actually, the thing about torsades. One funny thing about torsades is it does come and go on its own. So people who, if you have a patient who has Torsades, who has passing out spells, you know, you go see them and you put them on the on the telemetry, and then they have a an episode of this and they pass out. It may only last 10 or 15 seconds, and they'll they'll stop on their own. So torsades twists in and out, and then it goes back into a normal rhythm, and then it twists in and out again. So it's, you know, when a person has torsades, sometimes we don't have time to to shock them before they go back into a normal rhythm. So you just have to keep them from doing it again. Any idea what things cause torsades? What do you guys give for it in the back of the truck? Yeah. So hypomagnesemia can do it. Hypokalemia can do it. There are drugs that we give people that can do it. Uh, we don't use a medicine called ticosin very much anymore. But you might see that from time to time. 
amiodarone, you guys see all the dang time. That doesn't cause it much, but it could. Sotalol, you guys have seen, seen Sotalol or beta paste probably in some of my patients. That can do it. The real trouble where you get with torsades is when you combine things, more than one thing, that will prolong the QT interval. So if you combine amiodarone with uh, Cipro, and then he throws up so you give him some Phenergan. Those three things together, all of them prolong the QT interval. If you combine QT prolonging drugs, you get torsades. So thank God we don't see it too often, but probably once every month or two we see somebody who has, and we don't see it as much anymore than that, we have Zofran. But we used to see Phenergan-induced uh, Phenergan torsades fairly frequently, once a month or so, because of its common use for nausea and vomiting, and if you use that in combination with other medicines that prolong the QT interval, then you get torsades. Anyway, magnesium works pretty well. In the hospital, we can pace people. Torsades is precipitated by um, delays, short, long, like we have your heart is beating and then you have a delay and a beat, a pause. After the pause, you're going to have torsades. So in the hospital, we can put temporary pacemakers in these people and pace their heart at 70 beats a minute until we figure out why they're having torsades. Oh, gosh. Left bundle branch block. You guys know bundle branch blocks? There's a criteria for determining heart attack or STEMI in the setting of bundle branch blocks. It is very, very hard. If you have concordant ST elevations going in the same direction as the QRS complex, um, in the inferior leads, that, that's probably a STEMI. Concordant meaning the STs are going up and the QRSs are going up. If you have big ST depressions in leads V1 through V3, when you have, let me see if I have an example. If you, when you, when you have uh, a left bundle branch block, typically in the V leads, V1, V2, and V3, you have this deep thing, and then the ST segments are elevated in the anterior leads. If you have ST depression in the inferior leads, that can be a STEMI equivalent. These are very, very hard. So if you look at lead 1 and you see some ST elevation, lead 2 and 3, some ST elevation, or if you see greater than 5 millimeter ST elevation in lead V1, or ST depression in V1, V2, and V3, that can be a STEMI. But these are very, very hard. In left bundle branch block cases, I tend to lean very heavily on the clinical uh, presentation. If you look at this patient, you say, I think this guy is having a heart attack. I'm much more interested. If you tell me this guy sprained his ankle and I did an EKG, I'm not real interested. I guess I, I because of, I, I probably, I was going to tell you my favorite left metal branch block presentation, but I probably should. The guy had an itchy, itching problem. <laughs> and they did an EKG and they saw a left metal branch block and thought it might have been a heart attack. So, thank God it was not a heart attack and his itching problem got better with some antifungal cream. So. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, so what's the big deal about all this stuff anyhow? So when we see patients with chest pain and we're deciding whether or not to call a STEMI, we're thinking about the risks of what's going on with their body, but we're all, I'm also thinking about the risks of what we may or may not have to do to try to figure it out and get them better. And we're talking about doing procedures that can kill people. The risk of dying from a heart catheterization is about one in 2,000, but if it's done in an emergency circumstance, I should say, of dying as a complication of the procedure. Not dying because of something that's wrong with the body, but dying as a complication of the procedure. The likelihood I might kill somebody by accident with that procedure is about one in 2,000. So, that's a serious thing. It's, it's not a high risk, but it sure, is, it sure isn't zero. What are, you, what are your biggest complications with that? With heart catheterizations? It depends on what you mean by big. Yeah, the biggest complication is being dead. Um, your risk of having, um, your risk of having any kind of complication from a heart catheterization depends on what you define a com as a complication. Uh, we usually use radial artery uh, access. Most people have some soreness of their forearm for three or four days afterwards. So that happens in 75% of people. That's pretty minimal, pretty mild. Most people don't, notice, don't much notice it after the first day. A little bit of ibuprofen, it's gone. Um, more concerning complications, though. When we do these procedures, we have to give people x-rays. X-rays can be damaging to the body. 
We have to give people contrast, which is that liquid that we inject in there that you can see with an x-ray camera. It makes that angiogram that we saw. And that can be damaging, particularly to the kidneys. Um, your risk of having kidney failure from a heart catheterization isn't zero. It really depends on how bad your kidneys are. People who have, and you guys see chronic kidney disease patients all the time, um, patients who are not yet on dialysis but who have significant kidney disease may have a pretty serious risk of going on dialysis if I kill their kidneys with that contrast. Uh, it's possible for us to cause a stroke. When we go to the heart, we have to go around the arch of the aorta and down to the heart. The inside of the, of the arch of the aorta and the aortic root, when you and I were born, looked like a lead pipe, smooth, smooth as can be. By middle age, there is plaque in there, you, me, and everybody. There's plaque in there. By the time you become elderly, the inside of the aorta, I remember when I was doing uh, um, you know, my anatomy classes, I was cutting open people's bodies and looking in their aorta, it looks like tree bark in there. So as you're bringing devices, catheters and wires through there, you can scrape off chunks and those chunks can go someplace. They can cause strokes, they can go off to other parts of your body and cause embolic disease. The likelihood that you'll have a stroke or a mini stroke from a heart catheterization is about one in 2,000. So it could happen. Maybe actually it's probably about one in 1,000. Um, and we can kill people with these catheters, with the wires we put in there. It's possible to rupture the arteries. It's possible to rupture the heart. Um, when you put a catheter inside an artery and you inject something into it, just like you guys have seen somebody's vein blow, I can blow a coronary artery. I can tear it. I can rupture it. Uh, I've seen that. I've done that. That's a bad thing. <laughs> Talk about sphincter type. That's, that's a sinking feeling. So it's not um, something that is a high likelihood of happening. It's not something that's a tremendous risk, but it's certainly more than zero. And it's a higher risk the older you are, the more frail you are, the smaller your arteries are, whether or not you have diabetes. Those are the four big risk factors. And every hospital that does angiography is part of the national database registry database, and that's where these numbers come from, because we all combine our data about uncommon complications, uncommon things, so we know how frequently they happen, how, you know, who we might expect more likely and less likely. And we all have backup plans for what to do if we tear that artery, if we cause that stroke, if we cause a fatal heart rhythm while we're tickling the right, uh, uh, the right side of the heart. When you inject the right coronary artery, you cause ventricular fibrillation, about one in 500 cases. Happened to me two, three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, working on somebody's right coronary artery. She decided to have a little nap. <laughs> we woke her right back up. She was fine, but you know, those are the things that happen. Anyhow, so when we when we think about going to the cath lab, we we, we take it seriously. Uh, there is some burden on cath lab staff being called in the. I was in the cath lab just on the way over uh, before coming over here, and they were called in three times last night, and they have to work all day today. That's, it's tough, you know, the, the nurses and, and the, the technologists are, are, cardiologists are people too, sort of. Um, and so there can be problems. And it, the biggest thing, I think, is delaying establishing the right diagnosis and making the wrong turn, like happened with John Ritter. It looked like an inferior STEMI. It wasn't. It was an aortic dissection. And now he's dead, but I, I probably wouldn't have changed anything. Anyhow, those are things to worry about. What can we do? Number one. You guys keep on doing the awesome job you have been doing. You guys are fabulous. You guys are wonderful. You guys do a great job. You guys are dedicated professionals. I know how hard you guys work to do a good job with what you do. That's why you're sitting here pretending to listen to me. <laughs> I know you can't get good sleep like this at home. We all realize that false STEMI alarms can't be avoided in many situations, but there are some downsides to it. So focus on the EKG interpretation. I should have said focus on the clinical presentation, frankly. And that's the most important thing. Does this sound like a heart attack? You guys are seasoned veterans. You guys have been doing this for a while. You can open up the door and say, that guy looks like he's fine. Or open up the door and say, that guy looks like he's having a big heart attack. Or open up the door and say, I'm not real sure about this one. And I, I, I value what you guys say about that. We all work together as a team. When you're uncertain, if you're not sure about it, send it to the, to the emergency department. You guys still don't have electronic transfer? Yes. Yes. You do have electronic transfer. So... Sometimes Good. it's in and out, but sometimes we've got problems. I take a picture and text it. So, <laughs> the, the, so the, the problem, there, there are problems with photo. So you got, you got to, 
if, if you guys send it through the electronic system, if you guys send it uh, through that system, they can instantly email it to me, and I can look at it in five seconds. If you take a picture of it and send it there, there are some problems. We usually try to send it there. I've received the wrong picture. The ER doctor thought it was the right picture, but it was a whole different day. It was the wrong patient. So try not, if we, if we have some, and there are HIPAA violation issues with taking photographs of people, people's medical record too. So if, if you can use the electronic system that you have in place to do that, that helps us a heck of a lot. But if you're not <laughs> sure, for heaven's sake, call us. We're here to work together and help each other. If we're not sure, then we can get an ancillary information in the ER, like the old EKG or an echo or a CAT scan. And that's all I got. Who's got questions? I have a random question. Yes, ma'am. So, if I said, oh, hi. Yes, ma'am. I know you have been going to the um, ER, but you artery. Yes, ma'am. So, if when we're placing our IVs, uh -huh. we know it's a STEMI and uh -huh. we're making one should we even be concerned where you want to go? Is there a way we can put no. our IVs where you can still use it? No. You guys are in the back of a truck or bouncing around or running around doing the best you can to get access in a person. If you see a, a, a vein that, that's right over my radial artery and you think that's going to be a great place to put your IV, put it in there. I'll go to the other radial artery. I'll do something else. Don't worry about it. That's, that's not something I want you guys to be much concerned about. Um, the times when that has been an issue for me, maybe one or two times a year. But like I said, if it's an issue for me, I go around it, I move a little higher, I move a little lower, I move the tubing out of my way, or I go to the other side. Not worried about that in the slides. Other questions? Is that it? All right, All right fellas. Thanks, thanks for having me.